Hi muckers, welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope you're all doing very well. Go and grab a drink because we are in for an intense video today. So this is something that has been honestly overwhelmingly requested um, and it's taken me a bit to get to it because the video at hand is three hours long um, and we're not going to be watching three hours today. Um, but what we are going to do is kind of skip and go between and I'm going to link you to the actual full um, interview down below. Um, we're not going to do all three hours. We're just going to kind of go here, go there, trying to get um, an understanding. Um, I have watched this um, once through a couple weeks ago and someone messaged me last night and they were like, Adam, you didn't cover it. And I was like, oh, that's true. So I'm going to do it tonight. So basically the niece of Jody Hildebrandt has spoken out about everything and it's really intense uh, a lot of people are speaking about it, still speaking about it, and we're going to get to it. So this is uh, Jesse Hildebrandt. Um, she went on Mormon Stories um, podcast, I think it is. Um, it's from a month ago. A lot of people have been talking about it. It's nearly a million views on YouTube, um, and it is very, very, very insightful. Uh, again, we're going to watch little parts here and there of it, and I will link the entire thing down below. But let's get into it. Um, I hope you're all doing well. I hope you all have your drink of choice. Tonight, I am going for a Diet Coke. Okay, Jesse goes by they, them. My bad. Um, so I have a Diet Coke tonight. This is my my little, my little treat of choice. Um, all right, so we will start to hear what they have to say about um, their aunt, Jody. And as we're all aware, anyway, Jody is the worst person. Um, but hearing their perspective of it, specifically being the niece... I mean, how much closer can you get than family? So let's hear them and let's get into it. All right. To, to talk about it, and it has to be, and I think it has to be talked about for any, any sort of healing, um, individually or collectively. We have to talk about these types of things um, for anything yeah. to change. Absolutely. Well, it's still a, an act of courage to realize that by speaking out publicly on behalf of yourself and on behalf of potential victims. And by the way, Jesse, they decided to speak up on this a month ago, like almost two months ago. So this was whenever things were only starting to hit the media. So for a family member to speak up like this was very, very, very brave. Elsewhere, not just of Jody, but just generally, it, it has the potential to really strain harm or even ruin family relationships. And so I just want to start by giving you, join, joining with our audience and, and thanking you, Jesse, for, for raising your voice and speaking out. Well, thank you for having a platform to do so. I, I really appreciate it. And I know that a lot of people appreciate it. Well, thank you. Well, it's also important, I think, to mention that your story is a very Mormon story. So uh, you very much fit as part of the program. Uh, really quickly, is it okay if we just plug what you do? And I um, I tagged you on Instagram, but just tell everybody a little bit about who you are and what you do. Because sure, maybe yeah. maybe when someone would first look at you, they would say that, that Jesse, they, they can't have a, a Mormon background, right? <laughs> no, I know. When people find out, they're, all, they're typically pretty surprised. Um, I, I tattoo. I'm a tattooer here in Seattle. Um, I do American traditional. Um, I love tattoo artists. Here. Um, I, I'm a, I'm a gym rat. I run, I'm a climber. Um, I love art and music and culture and, um, I love to learn and, um, I'm, <laughs> I'm kind of a grandma, honestly. Like I am like a up at six in bed by 10 making sourdough bread kind of person, like very much a cottage core <laughs> goth, <laughs> if you will. Um, but yeah, I, uh, I, I grew up in the church. Uh, my family's still very much involved on all sides. Both of my parents come from large families and pretty much everyone is still very much involved. Um, and I, I was, I was in it. I believed it real, real strong. I, um, even when all this stuff was going on with Jody, which I think made it so much worse is I, because I was internalizing it, I fully believed that this was God's will. And if I just, um, put myself over to the, to the Lord, if I just prayed more, if I was more faithful, that all of this would, um, end up being for good and that I, that I needed it, that I truly needed everything that Jody was doing. I deserved and I needed it. So, um, yeah, I what was... Such a scary way of living when you feel that you need to have the approval of any sort of higher being and you feel that you are not enough, so you're constantly chasing what you can't achieve, specifically when you're doing it for family members or family members are pushing it on you. I think it's one of the most um, dangerous things mentally, um, specifically as someone who's very, very, very young in the fundamental years of their development, which Jesse was, um, and all the family members were. Um, as we're aware, Jody was the family therapist for Ruby Frankie, Kevin Frankie, and their kids. Um, and basically, Jody came in and, and, and flipped shit. 
you know, changed everything, changed the rules, and it really became this this close knit bond with Ruby Frankie, and the rest is unfortunately history where. It, it just changed for the worse when Jody came in. And that is equally Jody's fault as it is, you know, Kevin and Ruby's as well. Um, because there are kids involved, there's a level of responsibility for all of the adults here. Um, but this is why hearing from a family member of Jody to me specifically is really, really, really interesting. Grow up, Jesse. Where did you grow up? And then kind of what was your Mormon upbringing like, if you're able sure. to share? Sure. Um, so I was, I was kind of split between Northern and Southern California. I was I grew up half in, until I was like eight, in Gilroy, California, which is a little town outside of San Jose. And then um, when I was eight, we moved um, to Corona, California, so Riverside, Orange County area. And there, I don't know if a lot of people know this, but there are a lot of Mormons in Orange County and Riverside. There's so many Mormons in Southern, in Southern California. Um, I grew up in a pretty um, Orthodox family, very, you know, no PG-13 movies. You can only watch the Living Scripture shows on, on, on uh, Sundays. Everything, you know, you fast every month. Modesty was super important. Um, you know, no caffeine, no, we didn't drink, we didn't drink sodas. We didn't, you know, my mom was a stay at home mom. My dad worked very traditional uh, family dynamic, um, which also plays a, a big role into the things that happened, the patriarchal familial structure. Um, how many, how many siblings and where were you in the birth order? Yeah. Um, I have two older brothers and a little sister. So there's four of us. Okay. Um, okay. Eldest daughter, you know, there's a whole bunch of um, stereotypes and things about that. And, um, yeah, we, my, both my brothers served missions. My dad served a mission. Um, two of my siblings are married, have children living temple, very temple, mar temple, marriages? temple marriages. Yeah. All temple marriages. Um, faithful, faithful people. Okay. And if you, if you had to think about your Mormon childhood, like preteen years, would you characterize it as relatively happy or not? Um, yeah, I, I would say so. Especially when we lived in Northern California, very, my mom. By the way, I do want to clarify as well, just in case for new people coming in, this is not the daughter of Jody Hildebrandt. This is Jody Hildebrandt's niece. So whenever Jesse is speaking about being raised in their stories, this is not necessarily immediately speaking about Jody. This is speaking about their upbringing. This is Jody's niece, not Jody's daughter. I do just want to get that out of the way first and foremost. We do get to hear about um, the family dynamics, uh, but this is not Jody's daughter. I was very much the classic um, homemaker crafts cookies cooked you know we like it was very fun and um involved um in my like childhood things started wait daz is saying use non-gendered terms but the reason i'm not is because jesse isn't jesse is using jesse isn't using non-gendered terms to describe themselves which is why i'm not Daz, come on. <laughs> Shifting, um, but anyway, thank you. Anyway, don't worry. Yeah. When I hit my preteens, like 12, 11, 12, uh, a lot changed. Um, even a little bit younger than that, like fifth grade, everything kind of started shifting. Um, but yeah, before, uh, um, I, I mean, this is not, I mean, I guess. Y'all better leave Daz alone. <laughs> kind of relates to the church because this person was in the church. Um, I was just severely bullied. And um, and then that, you know, the, all the, the problems and issues that go along with that and um, you were you were bullied by like a fellow member of your ward. Yeah, uh, uh, my best friend actually. She uh, female dynamics are very very strange and very complicated. Yeah. And uh, bullying in that way was really it's very psychological. Um, and so there were a lot of like psychological things going on that also the people were aware of and did nothing, which is a going to be a very common theme in the story of mm. um, put my blinders on, not my problem, or hopes and prayers, God will sort it out. Mm. Okay. I think that's such a upsetting thing to hear um, whenever someone is talking about being, we're going to um, skip on a little bit to um, Jesse's dad and Jody being siblings and uh, Jody's childhood. Um, again, I said, we're going to kind of skip along and I'll link down below and you can go to everything if you want. But if you're being severely bullied and being like, Oh, well God, this is God's plan. It's like, What an awful way to live. It's like, oh, no matter what happens to you, like, ugh, please, God has a has a a plan for me. Like anyway, so let's uh jump a little bit ahead. Their father with my grandfather, Jay. Um, and they had a pretty wild childhood. I mean, my dad is the eldest of seven. Um, so he was born in nineteen sixty. My grandpa 
Hi, Lucy, if you see me in Mucker's chat when you watch this on YouTube. Hi, Megsy. Was a colonel in the Air Force. Um, they ended up, they lived in Tripoli in North Africa for a number of years. Um, and I, I also want to say, like, the grandfather that I that I had was not the father they had. And I, I and I know that. Like, the person that I knew was a soft little marshmallow man, like, that read Shakespeare. I am certain that's not the experience they had. Um, but yeah, my grandfather was a military man. My grandmother was a force to reckon with. She um, not, I would say, in my experience as from a, for, as a granddaughter, not maternal in any way, shape, or form. Hard, hard woman. Um, five foot ten, five foot eleven, tiny powerhouse of a woman. Terrifying. Um, mm. uh, my father's brother. Um, there, there was a death. It's so unfortunate that most of. Um, what they're describing here when it comes to family members is like words like terrifying or scary or, you know. A sibling death that happened. Um, and I know that that had uh, Yeah, the grandmother we're currently speaking about is Jody's mother. Yes. Very immense emotional toll on my grandfather and my grandmother. Um, but my, my dad and Jody are very, they're pretty far apart in age. So I don't even know how much of their childhood, like how much crossover there was. Because Jody, I think, is the youngest or second youngest. I can't remember if Roman or Jody is the youngest, but there was a pretty big age gap. Um, I don't know about Jody's childhood. She would say things, but again, I, I don't know what is true or what isn't true. Um, she, she made really wild claims about siblings, about my grandfather, about they, uh, my grandparents, um, from what I understand, um, fostered children from the Navajo tribe when they, because they lived in, um, in Arizona for a long time. Um, she made, made claims about the children that they fostered. Um, but Jody started, from what I understand, Jody started, um, this whole process of like, destroying people's lives, I think very young. Um, I know that she like- Oh, fuck. Jesus Christ. This is a, a family member, by the way, the niece of Jody Hildebrandt saying that from an early age, I know that it was Jody's mission to destroy people's lives. Like that's what Jody did. Hell. Was trying to ruin uh, someone's, uh, like a teacher's life. And again, this is really hard. I don't know what, if there was truth to this, um, but I think she was like trying to get a teacher fired when she was in high school. And um, she tried to, she got her therapist's license taken away. Um, and I don't know if there, like if it started out as truth, as like she was doing something that um, that needed to be done and then that spiraled into what she's doing now, or if this has been like this type of behavior from the beginning, I don't know. Um, from, what, from what you know, did Jody have a normal teen? Were, 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 were Jody and your dad raised in Southern California? Was it in Utah? And was there anything disturbing or troubling or abnormal about Jody's teen or young adult years that you're aware of. There's spe no. there, there yeah, speculations just, about her that I don't necessarily want to feed. But sure, do you yeah. think she had a normal developmental Mormon childhood and young adult years? Or is, do you know anything about that that you are able to share? I don't I, I don't really know a lot. I know that something that my grandfather told me, because um, I, I, I lived with him. I lived with my grandparents um, alongside living with Jody in the beginning, like when I first moved, like when I was first left in Utah. Um, and my grandfather was also my uh, eighth grade English teacher. And so I, I've always had a really close relationship with him. Um, he, he told me that if he could redo the way he raised his daughters, he would. And that he felt like I was like a redemption for that. Um, mm. this is before the abuse got really bad. So I, I think he would probably not agree with that anymore. He's, um, he passed away a number of years ago, but, um, I don't, I don't think so. She was a basketball player. She was like a really good basketball player. Um, I don't think she had a lot of friends. Um, I think that she, I think, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if she had a lot of friends, but, um, nothing, I don't think anything abnormal. She was raised in Tucson, Arizona from I think that's like the only place that she lived. Um, at that point, my grandfather, I believe, was working in prisons. He he um, taught he taught in prisons for a long time. Um, he helped um, inmates get GEDs, and he taught like woodwork. And he was a he was like a Shakespearean, so he loved Shakespeare. So he would teach poetry and and Shakespeare to, to inmates. I believe that's what he was doing at that time. I could be wrong, but I think that's what was going on. But so. Um, this question is probably going to sound out of left field for some people, but I, I think I feel okay asking it. Um, basically, there, whenever, you know, we, it's well established that Jody Hildebrandt it has used a lot of homophobic, anti-LGBT, almost hate speech in, yeah. in her therapeutic practices. Yeah. And then you combine that with reports of how she treated men specifically. In I was about to say, one of her main things, other than all of that, is that Jody Hildebrandt, if you're a man... Jody Hildebrand hates you. Like, it is one of the most insane, like, the stories I have... Oh, my God. The stories I have heard about Jody when it comes to just men is crazy. Like, 
is just crazy. Like she will get her way into households and do everything in her power to get rid of the man. Like, not oh my throat making a Diet Coke noise. Like she will do everything in her power to get rid of the man. Like regardless of what it is. And allegedly I've like heard a lot of things behind the scenes fucking just doing a little bit of digging and also speaking with people who have written about this where allegedly she's done some very, very, very manipulative um let's say planting some things so that the man is forcefully removed from the house allegedly it's just a little i can't i don't want to say too much because it's like i don't have any i've only heard two journalists say the story but you know there are stories floating around behind the scenes where she is planting things so that the man is forcefully removed from the house um it's it just it's crazy her distaste for men obviously a lot of you know other um kinds of people as well specifically minorities but like just fuck me in her therapy practices and then you combine that with the information that she apparently has a real history of dual relationships and inappropriate relationships with the the women in the couples that she's counseled there's there's a lot of wondering whether a lot of her um unethical therapeutic practices stem from some sort of repressed same sex sexuality, which we are, we are LGBTQ affirming on Mormon stories podcast. But I think it's fair when you see so much hatred towards the LGBTQ community, sometimes that is actually just repressed, um, you know, same sex sexuality. Is there anything you, any information you have about that? Or is that just purely something you can't speak to really? I can't really speak to it. It's something that, I mean, I thought it's all speculation. Yeah. Um, Okay. I've thought that since I was a kid. That what? That potentially she was queer. Um, okay. and, and I'm I'm queer, so I'm I'm for it. I think it's great. It's real great. Waters are warm. Um, and I ha- but I have no idea. She did she did say something to me when I was living with her that was very strange because um, I I've known I was queer since I was like seven, um, and it was like experimenting with with girls and friends since I was seven or eight, um, and uh, that was she knew about that and it was very bad. It was very evil. Um, but then she said something to me. She had this friend. Her name's Bev. Um, she she said something to the effect of yes, being gay is evil and, um, you know, pleasures of the flesh and yada, yada. But if I were to have sexual relationships with my <laughs> friends, if we were to, like, it would be different because there's an, a deep emotional connection there. And that's different. She goes, but it's different if I'm a lesbian because I love them. <laughs> like, <laughs> she goes, but please, I hate lesbians, but let me be one. She goes, free my mind, art pop, you make my heart stop. Free my mind, art pop, you make my lazy heart stop. Seriously, Jody Hildebrandt, lesbian? Ooh, makes sense. And like like we were sitting in someone's living room and she said this and I was just like, what? (laughs) Yeah, that's called being gay. Like, what do you think gay relationships are like? They are emotional and deep and connective and... Yeah. <laughs> so I, I, she did. That, that is something that she said to me. I think, I mean, other people were there. I don't know. I don't remember who was there. Um, but that's the closest thing I've ever had where she like admitted out loud to anything. Okay. Really quickly, uh, Jesse, would you mind uh, just really quickly expressing or um, describing your gender identity? There are people um, misgendering you and I may have done it myself in the introduction. So would you mind if, if you're comfortable sharing your gender identity, your pronouns, yeah. and j- just because there, there are people misgendering you in the comments, and I think that's important to address. Yeah, I mean, I use they, them pronouns. I identify as non-binary. Um, gender identity is complicated and complex, and um, I believe gender is a social construct. Um, gender is separate from sex, um, like the sex of someone. Um, I think that there, there are certain terms that I use, like biologically, like I'm biologically female, I know that, and um, there are certain like conditional or like experiences, culturally cultural experiences that are specific to the female experience. Um, like, so I, when I reference like being raised, like all, like as I was raised, I was conditioned female. And so all of the experiences are within that scope. Um, I, I just love it when people try. I know that people slip up, I slip up, um, but it's, it's more of the, 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 the respect of, of trying and correcting and yeah. Okay. Thank you for uh, being willing to educate us. That shouldn't be your job, but, but we appreciate it. Okay. So maybe let's start getting into how you're your Mormon life went sideways and then how Jody comes into play if you're comfortable going there. All right. I do want to go to, um, but I want to go to this part right here. 
um, which was a story of staying over at Jody's house for um, their grandparents' anniversary. Now, I do want to get to this part. I have a couple other parts I want to get to as well, but this was one of the main parts that stuck out to me. Later, it's 10 o'clock at night, 11 o'clock at night, maybe even later. Um, all I know is that Jody and my parents had a conversation. Jody told them to leave me with them. I mean, me to, like, to leave me with, with her um, and for them to just go and to not say anything and to just pack, pack the things and just go. And so a few hours later, I get a knock on the door. I was asleep. It was Jody and my grandparents telling me that my family had left and I wasn't going with them and that my life was about to change pretty dramatically. Um, I still remember that moment as just it's completely galvanized itself into, <laughs> into onto my soul. It was, a uh, you know, in movies when they do the, like they zoom in and pull out at the same time. It was like, that's that really wild kind of effect. That's how it felt. What the actual f This is it with Jody. It's like Jody loves, loves, loves having control of everything because she has no control of her actual life. So she likes having control of every other person's life. And here we see her doing it to her niece. It's like... Um, yeah, everything everything changed in that moment. And then in the beginning, the, the restrictions were lighter, um, but everything was revolved around my worth. So anything that gave me a sense of worth, I was not allowed to have anymore. I had really long, long hair that I loved. Um, had to cut it all off because it gave me a sense of worth. Going to school gave me a sense of worth. Not allowed to do it. Um, I was homeschooled for, I think, about half a semester until I was not allowed to go to school at all. And I was very good at school and I really liked school. Um, but again, anything that gave me a sense of value or a sense of worth, I wasn't allowed to do because it was ego. And it was What do you mean? Okay, so you like school? You're not going anymore. You like your long hair? not going any it's just it is so and you know what's so scary about this that this was what would you assume like i don't know what age they are um i don't want to assume but i'm getting like early to mid 20s right so assume 20 something years ago right Jody was doing this. Fast forward 20, you know, something years now. This is what Jody's doing, where we're told that Kevin Frankie had to leave the house and the kids, you know, had to just be under Jody's control. Ruby Frankie's kids. You know, it's like. What is it with needing proper full control and having nothing but full control? It's scary. It's a distraction for like from the, the darkness that was inside me. Um, the shame and it's so deeply darkly ironic that her whole thing is about shame like her whole therapeutic modality is like contingent upon this idea that shame is so bad and evil and that's what's causing this like issue with like mental illness and the issues of your soul it's just if it wasn't so horrible it would be funny really um, uh, really quickly jesse if you don't mind like so it sounds like your parents dropped you off in utah um and said your grandpa slash aunt are going to take over parenting you and and we're going back home did i get that right or am i misunderstanding yeah. They, this was not on the agenda. So we were there for my grandparents' 50th wedding anniversary. Not no so this was something that Jassy didn't even know was happening. Does it sound as random to you as it does to me? Because that's what it was to Jassy. Like, what the actual... F I can't even imagine what that feeling is like. No one should have to imagine what that feeling is like for that, you know, sake. From Orange County, right? Oh, yeah, from Corona. And... Okay. They didn't tell me they were leaving. No, no, nothing was communicated to me that they were leaving. I was left in the middle of the night with Jody and my grandparents. Um, and, and Jody was I, living. Jody was living with your grandparents at that point, or Jody had a home in American Fork. Jody was a very successful therapist at this time. Was um, Jody married at the time or divorced by then? Jody was divorced. Jody was only married, from what I understand, um, for about a year and a half, and um, very much divorced at this point. And, and, and uh, the world, they, Jody had one child with her ex-husband. And what, what's that? She had two children. Two so, children in a year and a half. Yeah, she. I, from what I understand, she was pregnant with her second when the divorce started. I don't, and I and I've I've heard different things about how long that divorce took. I heard it was dragged out for years. Um, but I, I that is spec I don't actually know that. For no, sure. I I've, I have heard that Jody tried to just. Uh, this may be strong words, but that Jody tried to destroy her ex husband. Oh, one hundred percent. Through the legal system. Through the legal system and through the church, she tried to have. Because again, if you are a man, for some reason. Jody Hildebrandt wants you dead. And it's like, oh my God, it, like just the parallels between these stories. Like, 
whether it's a minority or it's just a man. Like Jody Hildebrandt is out to take you down, or a child as well, by the way. Minorities, children, and men. If you cross Jody Hildebrandt, she wants to kill you or something like that, or just ruin your life. Like how the Mexican communicated, she tried to have his temple recommend taken away. Um, she said horrendous things about him, and I mean, she, <laughs> she. It sucks because it's like, yeah, we want to believe women. We want to believe abuse, of course. And like as a victim of abuse, I want to be believed, of course. And uh, Jody's ex-husband, um, I don't know him personally, but I, Alex, her daughter, um, and I are, we've kept in contact over the years. Um, she has a, a beautiful relationship with him, um, loves him to death. He loves her. There's, he's so supportive, so kind, um, really helped Alex through her own process. And um, Alex, this is like a further uh, down the timeline, but Alex left about a year after I did. Um, the church? So, no, no, no. She's still a member, but left Jody's. Okay. She, okay. she, left, she left Jody's care about a year after I did. Jody's care, because Jody has control of all of them for some fucking reason. Has nothing to do with her mother. Changed her name. Has no contact with her. Um, Alex is, has worked so hard to build a beautiful life for herself. Um, I know we've chatted since all this happened, and I know that she doesn't feel super um, comfortable coming forward. She has a, a family, and Jody, she doesn't want Jody to have any more control over her life, and. Um, so these people are still fearing this. People family. are still fearing this. She was living in American Fork in this massive home about two blocks down from the temple. Um, both of her kids were living with her and, and me. Mm, okay. And I guess I just can't imagine the heartache. I mean, when, when you think about a family dropping you off with grandma and grandma, grandpa and aunt, And it's a setup. Notice, and then just almost abandoning, yeah. maybe fully abandoning their child. Like I think what the kids into heroin, the kid yeah. has had multiple teenage pregnancies. Yeah. Like, but even then it's, you, you talk to the kid, you get therapists involved, you know, you, you, you get consent of the child, you know, you try and make sure the child would, would be okay or even want to, to have a, a massive change in living arrangements. I guess I would just ask. Well, oh yeah. Cause completely isolating the child and changing everything they know. Oh, that'll help them. What great therapy fucking. Jeez. How did that feel? And have you, was there, like, I'm just trying to imagine how extreme it must have felt for your parents to make such an extreme decision. And was there anything that merited that? I know. It's, well, again, this goes back to this, this culture, my familial culture of pretend like everything is okay. And that was the, that was the, because of the, the, um, the punishments were always so extreme in my family to things that, like, when I compared it to, like, things my friends were doing that would just get little slaps on the wrist. Like, I got grounded for three months for having a MySpace. And I'm certain my parents would correct me and say, no, you were grounded for three months because you lied about having a MySpace. But that, that is like, I was grounded constantly. I was anything that would like, the thing that the Mormon church. Because at this stage, they're looking for things to get you in trouble for. So I don't care if it's MySpace, you having a phone, you smoking a cigarette, you walking outside when you were supposed to be in bed, you drinking an energy drink, you like... They're they're wanting to control you more, so they will look for anything. So the MySpace was just a perfect, you know, a, a thing to do. The, one of the things that's so tricky about it, and especially when you're leaving the Mormon Church is, or or any sort of like Orthodox religion, is that your barometer for right and wrong is so skewed, distorted. It, it's so distorted. Where having a MySpace, having a, drinking a coffee, murder, sex, like there, there's it's it's so black and white, and there's not a hierarchy of like maybe this is worse than this, like everything. And, 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 and then that was just uh, exponentially worse with Jody, where there, there is only good and evil. There's no in between. And most things fall into the category of evil. So, but that was like, the thing that Jody so good at is that she, she's so good at seeing her victims, um, like using what's there already. So she saw me as an angry teenager. And so she, she, she's like, I could use this, you know, like, oh, you're angry because you're evil. You're, you're sad because you have so much sin inside of you. Oh, you, It's just like the most, it really is evil, but it, it's just like so fucking manipulative and I actually don't even have words for it. You've kissed girls? Oh my God, you are just Satan himself. And I, and I, I, I don't say this hyperbolically, like 
she genuinely believed, literally believed that Satan was working through me. And your mom, your, your mom, my aunt, my aunt. Oh, okay, um, okay. and she so Jody believed that Jesus was working through her and um, that she was fighting Satan on a daily basis, not just with me, but also with her clients. And she would tell me that all the time, that these men that she was talking, but specifically the men, um, that she was combating Satan on earth every day. Jody Hildebrandt is Satan. And, then, and, and and that was like, you know, and I, again, I believed all of this. So I was like, wow, like my aunt's powerful. Like she's fighting Satan. Like, yeah. wow. Yeah. And this, this is, as far as I understand it, over the past 20, 30 years, the most recommended therapist in the Wasatch Front by the Mormon Church, because every single person that's reached out to me to tell a horrific story says that it was their bishop yeah, that recommended yeah. Jody Hildebrand because Jody must have been on a list. And Jody would always begin her, her engagements with clients, Mormon clients, saying that she had direct relationships with Mormon apostles, that she was yeah. influential in the church developing its mental health programs. Oh, yeah. So, oh, no. Okay, the mental health she, programs. She had a meeting. I don't remember what apostle, but she <laughs> went into this meeting, her her story. I don't, she just told this to, to the people like my grandparents and I going in, like banging on his desk, talking about the, the, the evil, not just the evils of pornography, but the, the destruction, the destructive nature of shame, which is just so, so ironic. Um, but yeah, no, she's been very like, this is like, this is crazy thinking about it now. I used to do her, um, billing. Social media? Oh. no, I, I did her billing oh. and, and she would bill the church. And so, um, like every client essentially, I would say like like the vast majority of her clients were from Bishop recommendations, um, just based off of the billing that I would that I would do for her. These religious setups, you know, spiritual setups, not all of them, but some of them are just very, they're just built on the grinds of corruption. I'm not saying it about all, I'm not saying it as a blanket statement, I'm saying it about some, if not most, are built on the foundation of corruption and trying to manipulate uh, and control. Because in the Mormon church, if somebody can't afford a therapist, ties and offerings might be used yeah. by the bishop who recommends you know his his ward members to Jody. Yeah. He would he would then foot the bill. So and the church was, was funding. So the Mormon Church was funding yeah. Jody Hildebrand's wealth yeah. and success and power. And and the church knew at least m my local ward, um, Bishop Angader knew what was happening. Um, and this is a, getting a little ahead of, of, of the story. Religious extremists use fear tactics to control. You said it. People in the church in my ward started becoming very nervous about what was going on. Um, they were becoming very concerned with just my physical, like what I was looking like in the church. And they would go, they went to Bishop Bangator and, and voiced their concern about like, they're like, something is wrong. And <laughs> Bishop went to Jody and told her, gave her, her, gave her the names of these people. And <sighs> she would have, what she did, um, I had to, the reason why these people thought I was, anything was wrong, according to her, was because I was emotionally manipulating them into thinking that. I would go to church and wear a long face and, manipulate them into feeling sorry for me, which was a very common theme about like through the entire process of living with Jody was if someone liked me, if someone felt sorry for me, it was all because of manipulation. And I was a masterful manipulator. Constantly. I was told this. I don't even have to point out the irony in that. Um, but it's just so disturbing that this person, Jody was so successful in the world of therapy and still was up until a couple months ago? Constantly. Um, to the point where, I mean, I, I believed it. I was like, you're right. I, I must be this horrific. And I was already believing I was evil because I was gay. And so like, if she plays into things that are already there, she finds the hot point and then drills into it. And she, she does this. I, I almost guarantee anyone that comes forward with, with a story about Jody, this is what she did. Um, and so she... I had to go around. We drove to all these people's homes and she would sit, she sat me in the car. She told me exactly what I was going to say to these people. She coached me on every word and I would go in and I would have to apologize to them for manipulating them into thinking that something was wrong and that Jody was actually saving my life and that I, um, that God was, you know, this was all brought because of prayer and, and revelation and visions and dreams and that Jesus was, and it sounds ridiculous to say now, but at the time it's like, I, I said like, Jesus is working here. And, um, and it like the way she was it's just it, all so manipulative a lot about what was happening and why she was doing it um in very very 
abusive ways. And I think something as well to note is to hear all these stories and then look at Jesse now, Jesse Hildebrandt and be like, look at how far they've came in the sense that they were pushed down and made to believe that they were the most vicious, villainous, evil, nasty, corrupt person, and yet they were still able to come into their own identity. And I think that that is something very, very, very much so to credit themselves on. Um, but she would say, like, we have to do these extreme things because this is a, this is spiritual surgery, and that's how she would rationalize. Wow, it. Spiritual like, surgery, surgery. fuck me. Removing the sin, we're surgically removing the sin from your soul. We're surgically removing Satan from you. And so I would, I would go to house to house. She would tell me exactly what to say. She was in the room. If I was, if I would deviate at all from the script, she'd be like, uh, 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 and she would pull me back. And then I would be like, I'm sorry. I, I just try to manipulate you in this moment because if I deviate, we're going to move a little bit forward, but it's just. <sighs> goal to keep a child from school. Um, it's full of shame that it has nowhere else to go. So it overflows into these um, neuroses and, and shame is a result of sin. And so what she did is because I wasn't getting better, I was getting worse, is that there was- This is about mental health, by the way. Still, sh There was still sin in me that wasn't coming out, that I hadn't confessed yet. And she was so hyper fixated on me confessing sin. And she, again, she was, she was convinced I was a sex addict. I was a drug addict. I had had abortions. I had kissed two boys. I mean, I had kissed lots of girls when I was like a young child. But at the time, like I was, I was giving Book of Mormons out at school. I had never done drugs. I had never had anything close to sex. I didn't even know, she was convinced I was also masturbating. I was a like, I had a masturbation problem. I didn't even know female anatomy people could masturbate. I didn't even know that. Um, but I would, because she was convinced, I was also not allowed to use tampons because she was convinced I was masturbating with them, which is insane. Um, so things got progressive. I mean, this sounds like projection. I, I don't know oh, if it's projection. Oh my God. Again, has to do with control, but it's just very disturbing beyond belief it's, it's so i know so yeah it it is i i do believe that there is a lot here to do with projection i mean if you're accusing your young niece of having too much sex drinking too much taking too much drugs it's like okay maybe this is reflecting what's going on in your life jody like maybe that'll explain why you're so fucking extreme like Things got progressively worse and worse and worse because I wasn't getting better. She was she she would say, I'm trying to make you so physically uncomfortable that it forces the sin out. And so that's when she started. I would have to sleep outside in the snow. That's when I was. Um, <laughs> so uh, when she would lock me in. I'm sorry, we just m moved past that really quickly. Forced to sleep out in the snow by Jody. This is someone who is a licensed therapist who still works with families up until she was fucking arrested a couple weeks ago. Ruby Frankie, a passengers, letting her kids run free with Jody Frankie. And this is in her, she worked in Lehigh, in like the, um, what's that area called in Lehigh with the golf course? Uh, th Thanksgiving Point? She worked in Thanksgiving Point. And, um, oh, I lost my train of thought. Um, uh, you were talking about her keeping you out in the snow and oh, yeah. torturing tor 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 you in, in various so ways. She had, she had a, a, an office in, in, in um, Thanksgiving Point. There was a little side office closet kind of room. It was like a little bit bigger than a closet that didn't have any windows. It had like a table, a chair, a, an actual closet. And that's kind of about, that's about it. So that's where I, when I, when I was pulled out of school and I started living with her full time because she worked, I went with her to work and that's where I stayed. And sometimes she would lock me in it. Sometimes she wouldn't. Um, but I was not allowed to leave. That was like rule number one. I was not allowed to leave that room. And, um, she would have me write out my sins on a piece of paper. And every day she gave me the same piece of paper. Um, and I would have to write out my sins and these sins that I was writing out, I was like, and again, I believed all this. I believed this fully. So I was like, oh, there must be more in me. I'm trying. I'm trying to think of it. Oh, one time I lied to my best friend, Scotty. And like, these are the types of things I'm writing out. And then she would come back in, take that paper, read it to me, make me get on my hands and knees and beg for forgiveness as she read this back to me. And then she was like, no, this isn't it. This is not it. This isn't all. There's more. There's more. There's more. And there wasn't. And I would start making things up because I was like, I don't know. And because she was convinced there was more, things got worse and worse and worse. Um, I ran away three times from her house. I went to a neighbor's. I went to the police. Um, they didn't do anything. So this is the story. This is very similar to the story of uh, Ruby Frankie's kid running away and going to the neighbor, um, except this time was not successful. And um, Because Jody is the most convincing person you'll ever meet. When I was talking, side note, the last time I met up with Alex, this was a couple years ago, she said something that I think is like so perfectly articulated into describing how 
manipulative and convincing Jodi is. And she said, I cannot be around my mom. I can't ever be around her again because if she told me the sky was yellow, I would believe her. She has this ability to like alchemize, like, like just get into your soul. It's like, the, it is horrifying. And there's no real way of explaining it to people unless you've experienced it. And, or if you've experienced this level of emotional abuse, there's no way of really like having, you, there's no way of understanding it. Um, so I, mean, I nar narcissistic cult leader comes to mind. Uh, yeah. Um, I don't know if this is, if this is fully true, but if I, from what I understand, she's been diagnosed with many, many, um, issues, including psychopathy. So, um, she, like, as far as I'm aware, she is a psychopath. Um, she, I, I was, I was forced to sleep. Okay. Uh, I was sleeping at first in her, um, she had like a little sunroom off the, off her bedroom. At first I was sleeping on a love seat in there. And then it got worse where I was sleeping on the floor. And then she would make me sleep on her balcony in the middle of winter. This is, this is like January, February in Utah. And she told my family that I was sleeping in like a really like high end, um, sub zero type of, um, sleeping bag. No, this was like a $5 Walmart brand sleeping bag. Um, and the balcony that I slept on for a long time, it was one of those single but even the family leaving your kid to just sleep in a fucking sleeping bag and being like, okay, all right. Like a single person, like just enough to walk out on. It wasn't like a big, so I couldn't even stretch out. And um, it, got, it was so bad that I would fantasize about jumping off the balcony and breaking my legs because, or stabbing myself because I was like, going to the hospital would be better than this. And when I went to the police, um, I told them like, can you just arrest me? Because I was like, I would rather be in jail like I will, I will call, I will go commit a crime so you can arrest me so I can be out of Jody's care. And then finally I ran away. I hitchhiked up to Salt Lake, Salt, Salt Lake from, from Lehigh. Um, and when I finally did run, I ran. And I remember I ran accidentally into the golf course and the golf course is surrounded with a, a fence. And I had a, like, I had a full blown panic attack when I realized that I was trapped because as I was running, I thought the whole time I was like, she's right behind me. She's right behind me. Any minute she's, she's going to find me. She's right behind me. And I ran into the golf course, um, Composed myself, started running again. I ended up sleeping in a church that night. I don't even remember where it was, somewhere around Lehigh. I walked for a long time though. Um, and then the next morning I, <laughs> I, I stole a $5 bill and a, a $5 bill, a pen and an ear warmer from one of the coats at the church. And I remember thinking, I'm going to write down the address so that I can mail this. I, I was overwhelmed with guilt. Of, like, I'm so evil. Um, and I was like, I'm going to mail a five, $5 back to, these, to this bishop or to whoever's at the church because I, I, I'm so evil for doing this. Um, but I just need food. And uh, I ended up getting picked up by, by someone who ended up being the sweetest man ever. And him and his wife got me a pair of sweats. I was also like wearing a, a skirt. I had the jacket that I had. Oh my God, sorry, I'm not saying much. I'm just trying to process this. But oh my God, like, again, we have a story of someone within Jody's care feeling that the only way of living is escaping. I mean, recently with Ruby Frankie's kid, and now we're hearing with Jody Hildebrand's niece, literally escaping to try to get to a different city or trying to get arrested so that that would be better than going back to Jody. It's like, and yeah, they are very lucky that they got picked up by someone safe. I mean, you've got to be very careful. But I mean, that further proves like the, the point of absolute desperation. Like, I... I really do just think that that is the point of desperation is very much so shown here. Very, very, very much so shown. Very much so shown. Okay, so we are going to finish this topic and then we are going to, so this is what we're going to do. We're going to finish the story of um, running away. We are going to go to this part about... Where is it? Um, Jody was actually put on uh, parole because she violated the um, HIPAA Act. Um, and we're going to finish it on that. But there's just... To know that this is who the church was endorsing as well, and to know that any kids had to be at the hands of Jody Hildebrandt, whether it's literally her family or just any other family and as recently as the eight passengers it's so scary that it took so long for her to be arrested and i hope she is behind bars for the rest of her life i hope that she is behind bars for the rest of her life for the rest of her life it was um because I, jody would take my jacket away after i started running like after the first time i ran away from her office but what had happened was her colleague had found a 
this big rain jacket, windbreaker, reversible jacket in the parking lot and threw it in the room that I was staying in, that I was like isolated in. And it wasn't, I, I don't, I, I, up until like this in very moment, I don't think it was intentional like to give to me. But now that I think about it, I'm like, I wonder if that was the case. But she put it in that room because they found it in the parking lot. And I remember the door was open. I have a jacket. I, I need to run. I need to go. And I remember that moment so vividly of it is now or it is never. I'm not getting out of this unless I leave right now. And I didn't think twice. I grabbed the jacket and I just ran and ran and ran. And um, I had a skirt on. I had moccasins on that. My feet were coming through the bottoms. Um, I, I, I'm certain I looked horrendously unwell. I, w- I had lost tons of weight. I was, I, I, my stomach was eating itself alive. I was, there was blood in my stool. It was, I was very unwell. I, she also like, I was, I was vegetarian. I wasn't allowed to be vegetarian. She would withhold food. Um, it's just insane. So I ended up hitchhiking um, to the road home in Salt Lake City under a fake name. I told these people that picked me up that I was 18. I went by the name Rudy Jude, which is like such a fake name. <laughs> um, and they, they figured it, they figured out that I was a minor. I kept slipping up on my name and stuff. And and they said, like, you either need to tell us who you are so we can help you um, or we're going to have to take you to the shelter because we can't harbor a minor. And I was like, take me to the shelter. I was so af- I was too afraid. I was too afraid that Jody would that Jody would get me. And um, I lived in the shelter for months. I don't the timeline of the shelter, like being homeless is really, really fuzzy. Um, there was everything that goes along with being a homeless female um, that happened. Um, I did get and I was I did eventually get caught by some detectives. Um, and then I went back to living with my grandparents um, thankfully, they didn't make me go back to Jody's. Um, I don't really know. I mean, that. fuck the entire family. Why? But I didn't. And then, um, yeah, it's a. So the grandparents take uh, Jesse back and just no questions asked. Like, you're not going to go back to Jody's. You're just going to stay with us again. We know that you've been homeless for a couple months, but hey, come back to us. What does that mean? How uninvolved as a family are you? The um the so I uh the day after I ran away the first time, so my aunt was making me run. She'd make me run sprints every night, and again for the reason of making me so physically uncomfortable that I would confess to sins, and she'd have me do it for hours and hours, and outside in the winter in the snow. And this one time in particular, I said no, and that was the day that I like walked away. I was like no, and I turned around and she punched me in the back and knocked me down. And Jody's a She's not tall, but she is sturdy. She is a powerful, like a powerhouse of a woman. Um, very strong. Um, and then I stayed out. I, so I sat down on the curb after that and walked over. And then I, she ended up going inside. I, I stayed outside and went to a neighbor's house. Um, the neighbor didn't know what to do. Jody found me, came in again. The neighbor was like, I don't want to tell her, but I have to because you're a minor and she has power of attorney and she's your guardian. And I can't, I can't lie to her. Um, and the next morning... Um, at like, actually that may have been after the police, after one of the times I ran away, I, I, I'm failing to remember which one was which. The next morning though, after I ran away, um, she pulled me out of bed by my hair, blindfolded me, tied my wrists, tied my legs. Where does this story sound familiar? We heard this with um, the eight passengers kids with the tying. Put me in the car and just started driving. And I think we stopped at, a, I'm, what I'm assuming, at a gas station. And at the gas station, she screamed at me to lay on the ground because I was manipulating people. If people could see me, I was manipulating them into thinking something was wrong. Um, so I laid on the ground of her car and she drove for what felt like hours into the mountains. And my other grandparents, not my not my dad's parents, but my mom's parents parked, I found this out afterwards, were parked at the base of the mountain to make sure I didn't run away. Um, and she had me run up and down for six hours up and down and up and down and and the other part about this oh my fucking god i want this woman behind bars for the rest of her life living the most miserable experience ever some of the time you're evil and horrible and wrong and the abuse is almost unbearable but then there are moments where you're rewarded all right we're gonna we're gonna finish it on uh the jody violating the HIPAA Act. Let's get to this. Patient client confidentiality rules in really egregious ways, right? Is that? Yep. Yep. Okay. And the Salt Lake Tribune, the Salt Lake Tribune wrote an article about her in 2012 about this. And I, I was 18 or 19 years old. I made a comment, a public comment on, on the article online using my full name. And I, I said something to the effect, the, the comments are not, because it's been archived, I can't see the comments anymore. Um, but something to this effect of, Jody Hildebrandt is my aunt. I used to live with her. Um, she's a monster. 
I can promise you this is not the last time you will hear about Jody Hildebrand. And everyone in my family saw it. And I guess what happened um, is that Jody dropped, I didn't know about this until years later, but apparently after I made that comment, and I was also in the process of finding a lawyer to take her to court. I was, I was getting ready to, to sue her for child abuse um, and to, to, to go down the, ro the route of criminally uh, charging her. Um, what happened was she, I guess, dropped off her son at my grandparents, like in a, in a, a tizzy and left the country. And for like an, like an, for how much, like for how long, I don't know. And I don't think she even knew, but she just left the country after that comment. And the way that my family saw it is I was again, ruining the family. And I got, Oh, cause everyone's to fucking blame except for Jody. And my dad is a, is a not, not practicing anymore, but my dad is a, a lawyer. Um, was a lawyer for a really long time. And so I, got, I have an email from him. I, I, I looked it up a couple of days ago. I haven't read it since I got it in 2012. And it is horrifying. But my, my dad wrote me this email telling me like, what would your family think? What would your, like everyone that knows you in Corona, what would they think? Like you publicly shaming this person is just, you know, deeply embarrassing. And, and I hate this entire family. Immature. And um, regardless of how you feel about Jody, like this is no one's business. And now you're making it public knowledge. And this is like, Think about your siblings, think about your cousins, think about your aunts and uncles. Oh, the fucking manipulation. The amount of shame. And I ended up not pursuing it because of that. And my dad also was just like, this is going to destroy your life. If you pursue this, it will destroy your life. And he's like, I say that as, a, as someone that saw it happen, the legal system going down this route will ruin you. Not like, oh yeah, let me support my child and help them bring to justice. Fuck the dad. Horrible monster. No, what would people think about you? What would your family think? What would your what would your neighbors? What would the people in Corona? Because the dad is protecting fucking his sister. When I was when I got left, they didn't tell anyone where I was. I guess people wrote letters, never received them. I when I when I finally did go back to Corona, people thought I had died. People thought I had gotten pregnant. People thought I was like in rehab. The rumors and the accusations. I lost all of my friends because they, my best friend was so so confused and hurt that I just like just disappeared and with no explanation. And then like this crazy. And then the stuff that did come to light was so insane because all of this is insane and unbelievable. But then who's going to listen to a kid? Who's going to listen to an angry teenager? So it's just like that. I, th I think that if I, if it was just the experience with my aunt, I think I could have healed a lot faster, but then for 14 years of being gaslit into thinking that it didn't happen or that I was just making things up or making things hard or causing harm just to cause harm, because that's just what I do. I'm just this, monster that causes harm and yeah there were definitely like emotional repercussions from experiencing this level of abuse and i do have complex ptsd and it's just yeah it's i don't, I don't even know how to succinctly wrap that up but mm. so did you end up graduating from high school and getting out like i guess getting out of utah i, I took a ged because the other part of that is like when you go through something that is so emotionally um niche and specific and um unlike your peers in such an extreme way being around like going to high school felt in it just felt so insane to me just to like just go yeah. I would have had my junior year and with like having just experienced very real life adult level um emotional turmoil of like homelessness and and, and sexual abuse I mean the sexual yeah. abuse was but the just like all of this like it just felt so silly high school felt silly at that yeah. point but I also I also really <laughs> this is a kicker though because I was still 17 I wanted and also to be ostracized from experiencing education, to be thrown back into it is college really bad. And I, I knew I could, I knew I was capable of doing that, but my parents refused to give permission because I wasn't emancipated. I was, I was technically still under their care. They refused to give permission for me to sign up for school. So then I didn't do that. And then it was just like years of then. And then, and then like I had to just work and I didn't have any skills and I didn't have the emotion. I had very low, <laughs> my emotional stability was not great. And so I just had, I worked, multiple jobs for until I was like 25 when I figured out I liked art and I started tattooing and yeah it's a the uphill battle of becoming a, a happy successful person in the wake of no no familial support and severe abuse is just it's it's uh inexplicable to to describe and I, in a lot of ways I do feel really lucky that I have been able to create the life that I have um, and to have the friends that I have in the community and the chosen family that I have. Um, I feel very, very fortunate. Nurture nature. I don't, I don't know why I was able to find my way through it. Um, but I'm, I'm very grateful for it. So did you end up, uh, leaving Utah, escaping? Your I do kind of want to end it there because this is getting a lot, um, cause it's real life. Um, I will link the entire thing down below if you want to go watch it, um, and send, uh, Jesse Hildebrand, um, some love. I really do think 
that that is a great point. Like, uh, it's like Jesse was the one that got abused, and then it's like, oh well, you know, praising them for coming out on the other side of it and building a life for themselves. Like Jesse shouldn't have been put in that situation in the first place. That they have to like, you know, come out on the other side of it, but they did, and they have this whole new life and whole new friends, and it's like. It's, Jody is just so disturbed 